thank you to all of you, to Gülsi and Hans especially for the invitation and for all of you and uh, to allow me to share with you some, some thoughts about Switzerland as usually when I'm uh, talking um, about that tiny, not so important country over there in the Alps, you know. Um, sometimes people are interested in that country because one says it's a sort of example of good democracy. And maybe this is not that true. Um, the title of my um, presentation is this, Swiss Confederation 2023. This year is an anniversary year. And what about the last 25 years ahead? Again, this is what they celebrate this year in Switzerland, this beautiful picture. It, isn't it nice? I mean, these uh, all allegorical figures, you know, that, that's the new constitution. Um, in the middle, you see that lady on the throne, so to speak, that is, that is Helvetia. And beside her, this is something like Mr. Switzerland or so, um, with the flag. And then you have the economy on the one side, the civil part of the population. On the right side, you have the military part. You see that, that nice angel or something like that in the heaven. This is, this is the one who um, pronounces peace. They have, they have made a peace. They, they had some differences. In the meantime, they have peace. They have found together and um, uh, adopted their new constitution. The paper this lady has in the hand is the new constitution. And if you look at it closer, the date that is um, written there, that's September 12th, 1848. So this means that now we celebrate, let's say they celebrate in Switzerland, the 175th anniversary of the birth of modern liberal democratic Switzerland. This is, this is what the mainstream says. This is what is in the hist history school books, you know. Um, we, we heard about this is, this is the official celebration uh, this year. A couple of days ago, on the 12th of uh, 2023, there was the official celebration in the parliament building, things like that. So that's, that's what I'm now talking about. How did it come to this beautiful event of that new uh, constitution? In 1815, um, they entered, these 22 cantons, entered in a loser confederation. So that was not a tight um, state constitution or something like that. It was a confederation, a relatively loose confederation. Um, I, I, put, I put everything in, in blue, what has to do with freedom, with libertarianism, with anarchy, things like that. And I put in red what is the opposite of it. And while they had this Loose confederation, I think, that was a quite decentralized, um, useful um, treaty. Within this group, the so-called liberals developed a quite extreme aggressiveness against the conservatives. Um, they even attacked, um, sort of militarily, uh, some small warlords out of the Liberal cantons went, for instance, to Lucerne, which was a, a conservative Catholic canton, in order to, to, to um, um, remove their government. That was not successful, things like that. But these attacked cantons, the conservative Catholic cant uh, cantons attacked, they made what one does in such situation, they made a treaty among them in order to defend themselves against their aggressive colleagues, you know. 
in this um, uh, confederation. That is the famous Sonderbund, huh? this special um, a treaty, this defense treaty, um, Sonderbund, something like like a separate, separate treaty, means Sonderbund. And of course the liberals are outraged, that's against our the rule we have, you, do, you are not allowed to form your own Sonderbund. They started the Sonderbund war and they won the war. The liberals against the conservatives. So these aggressive liberals started the war and won the war. And of course they used that as a pretext not only to dissolve this Sonderbund, which would have been the logical consequence, but to implement a new constitution, to enforce a new constitution. And now you see the figures um, how this constitution became into force. There were 15 and a half cantons that adopted this um, constitution. Of course, that were the winning part of the Sonderbundkrieg, so the, the, the winner, out of their, you know, strength position, they implemented this constitution, this half, 15 and a half, this is because some cantons had been divided earlier, that's why not just 15 cantons, but 15 and a half, um, were for this constitution, while the loser, of course, approximately, there were some some uh, neutral cantons as well, but in principle the loser of this war were against 6.5. Now, unanimity would have been necessary in order to form a new state out of a group of principally independent small states. It's not possible to form them together just by majority, and this, this was generally accepted by international law, by state law, so to speak, what that kind of state was concerned. It was quite clear, unanimity is necessary in order to form a new state. But they were the winners, and that's why they enforced it. In other words, this beautiful event here, you should write it not in blue letters, but in the red letters, according to my, you know, color principle, um, that was not, I would say, the birth of modern liberal democratic Switzerland, but it was an illegal coup d'etat. That, that's what we are celebrating this year, <laughs> strangely, but I think these are the facts. Of course, they call it differently now the mainstream from the left to the right. Everybody says, no, 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 that was not illegal, that was revolutionary. They put it in blue, you know, and say that was liberation, a revolutionary revelation from the Ancien Regime, that, that was against the conservative cantons, you know, um, and, and that's why that this, this looks a bit like like king, king of France or so, and, and they, they resisted against that, and that's why it's not quite illegal, it's revolutionary. And, and they have an argument. So these official historians, they say around Switzerland and other countries too, there were revolutionary movements really against Ancien Regime um, authorities, uh, mainly not quite successful at that time, maybe later when these national states um, were created. Um, and that was just, you know, such a revolution in Switzerland. But that's not true. Um, in Switzerland, they did not stand up against, you know, some higher um, ancien regime structures. Um, what we have here is something different. Again, in red, I would say a aggressive subjection of defensive, peaceful, conservative cantons. 
So that was not revolutionary, that was just simple illegal. So I would say that constitution is an illegal constitution. And this is what they celebrate this year. Now, one could think, okay, that was a, that was a, a stigma huh, of that situation. Maybe in the meantime, this was, this was healed. Um, the stain was, was wiped out. Um, but this too is not the case. There has been several partial amendments of the Constitution, but there have been two total revisions. They call it total revision. And um, here again, first we have again this, this uh, new Constitution of 1848 with this cantonal majority I already mentioned, 15.5 against 6.5. Um, and by the way, um, it's not only a confederation of the cantons, but also of the people. Uh, they did not, uh, not only count the cantons, but also the people. And if you look at it close, closer, of course, there were more yes than no. But there were many, very few only people that were allowed to vote. And that's why, if you compare it with the whole Swiss population at that time of 2.4 million people, those who approved it, explicitly approved it, wrote yes on uh, the slip. These were 6% of the population. Of course, one can say um, those who did take part, these were a sort of representation of the whole population, but I think six 6% is a little bit small to be, to be able to represent the country. So these were the figures, 1848. And now what these two further total revisions are concerned, unfortunately, that was not different. We see that here there was a, a revision in 1874. The very same cantons, um, almost the very same cantons were for this um, revision and again um, these again the same parties you know winner of Sonderbund and loser of Sonderbund uh, there were even two more cantons against that so it was even far away from this unanimity that would have been necessary and then relatively a recent revision we had in 1999 which was purely a formal one, not, not very much uh, content related. Um, there, again, that, that's really, a, it seems, a stable, a stable relationship. 13 cantons pro and 10 no. If, if you count precisely, there is one canton more in the meantime. Canton Jura came, came uh, to, to university that was one canton was divided into two and that's why the, the sum is one more. Um, and what the, the population is concerned, um, you see this is a bit higher than in, in eight, 1848, but um, uh, it's 12% in 74 and 13%, about the same ratio in, uh, in 1999. And one, one can ask, well, is this representative? Uh, where do they take their right to, you know, to give a constitution to the other 87%? I do not know, but... So that this means that this, this stain, this mistake, this illegality in the original constitution is still there. So that's what I wanted to share with you about the celebration in Switzerland. But now we, it's only a quarter of an hour, and that's why I add something else. So, how, how shall we deal with this? I mean, is this the situation? Okay. Um, or shall we try to put it in a, in a broader context? And in order to do that, I would like to go back to this gentleman. Um, maybe you recall 
him from my speech two years ago in 2021. Uh, this is the famous, at least in Switzerland, the famous um, William Tell. Um, blue, I take him in blue, of course, because he is the anarchist. William Tell is, is a mythological person, of course, in 12,000, 1291, he, he, he killed the tyrant. Um, and it's typical for him. He doesn't speak very much, he acts. He doesn't go to assemble assemblies in order to discuss political issues, he acts. That's why this famous sentence of him, everybody in Switzerland knows it, the axe at home oft saves the carpenter. So he, he builds his house and repairs his house with the axe. He doesn't need anybody else. He shoots the tyrant not with the axe, for that he has the uh, crossbow. That's William Tell, huh? the anarchist. And on the other side, we have this gentleman. He is called Hermann Gessler, also out of this uh, drama by Friedrich Schiller. Um, he says, I'm the emperor's servant. He is the, the embodiment of the top-down approach. He is the repre representative of power, or one can say he is the archist. You see, the anarchy is, is, is not, as, as you know, something like unorder or so. Anarchy means without arche, without predominance, without monopolized power. This is what um, um, anarchy means. And the opposite, I mean, without this negative um, uh, part is archism. And that's, I mean, the state is a archist structure. And Hermann Gessler is the, you know, um, personification of archism. And then, um, now we are trying to put that in a broader context. What I developed then two years ago was this, that I said, here on the arrow of the, of, of the history, and starting over there in that mythological um, story of 1291, with, on the bottom side, I put the archist part in blue. On the top side comes the, the the, the anarchist in blue, and on the top side, the archist in red. That's why Gessler is there, and Tell is on the bottom side. Now we have this tradition I, I showed last time, this anarchist tradition, one could say, of Switzerland. They never had a center in the sense of a capital or a, a common government or something like that. That was always a treaty, something loose with a lot of conflicts, be it between Catholics and Protestants or conservative and liberals, as I showed you before, that was typical. That was not paradise at all, but that was anarchism, in a way. Um, until this happened, when Napoleon came a couple of centuries later and introduced this Helvetic Republic, that was a unified, Napoleon-minded, um, liberal uh, country, but not for a long time. Um, after Napoleon, they had this treaty I mentioned before, you know, this, this uh, confederation. And then, as we know, in the meantime, we had the civil war, we have the illegal constitution of 1848, and then um, we, we have this, one could say, the archist development. One could say, until mid of 19th century, they have more or less this anarchist tradition, and then it changed to the archist uh, development um, by this event they celebrate this year. Of course, and during that time, uh, ongoing concentration of power. So we have this, this, this broader context, what, what the Swiss history a bit more back is concerned, and now, if you still still alive and awake, yes, it's fine. Um, I would even broaden more the context. Also recalling what I showed you two years ago, the even bigger picture. Maybe you 
um, recall this. Again, we have on the bottom side this an an anarchist cultural behavioral de development going back to the Neolithic Revolution, agriculture, sedentariness, and, and a, a big part, at least, of um, humanity that was still in decentralized, not monopolized structures. For instance, Switzerland, you see here, you know, with, with the timetable then um, what we saw before, but that was the prolongation of a much longer anarchist tradition of humanity. But, as then I showed you two years ago, somewhere in the past, not as close as this Swiss history, but some thousands of years um, earlier, around 3000 before Christ, um, this new phenomenon, phenomenon of states altogether came up, namely with these big city-states in Mesopotamia uh, as, a, as a new phenomenon. And then uh, one, one could say that from that time on there was a still developing and concentra um, concentrating history of power with the Roman Empire, with absolutist states, with the national states, then we come to our closer story. So this is the, the even bigger, um, you know, context with the state altogether to put our Swiss story into that story. And of course, like always in these red parts where these archist structures are at work, it's accompanied by battles, you know, by wars such as, for instance, world wars, this is typical for the red part. That was the broader context. Now let's go back to our tiny Switzerland, to our celebration. We, we have that other context now in, in mind and are going to this. Um, as I told you, on the 9th, of, on the 12th of um, September, they celebrated. Huh? Happy birthday. Um, actually, now to put it more precise, what do we celebrate? In the meantime, you know it a little bit, but just to summarize, what we celebrate is that civil war, the illegal constitution. What we further celebrate is, for a long time, the Catholics, those conservative cantons, were excluded almost out of the political discussions in the parliament, in the government, on federal level, they did not find, get, they did not get a, a, a noticeable um, representation. Um, in war times, of course, Switzerland, like, like all countries, made their uh, martial law with mandatory draft, mandatory uh, conscription, um, that, that not untypical for states, things like that, then for instance, these are just, just examples. The permanent war tax, this is a, a, a nice uh, story in Switzerland. During the Second World War, they introduced by martial law a tax. Wer steuer, wer means defend, you know. It it's all, all, almost sounds like war tax. They introduced it not in an official statute, in a legislated statute, but in an ordinance from the government, um, Beschluss, außerordentlicher Beschluss, exceptional decision, something like that. Um, and after the war, they did not stop with that. They said, well, we needed a little bit more. We have provisionally to extend this um, decision for some years, and after some years they said, oh, we, we, I, I think in the meantime we really do need it, and they extended it even more. And sometime that was not a decision, an ordinance anymore by the government, but an official statute with the same content, uh, but still called war tax. And then came the moment where they said, and now we call it direct federal tax. And since then, 
the federal taxation plays a considerable role. This is what we celebrate too. Um, and then all these typical wars states make, such as war on drugs, of course, prohibition, to total pro prohibition of many drugs. Um, <laughs> that, that you know that. War on climate change, which is very um, like in other countries, maybe with little nuances, but in principle the same as in, in other countries in Switzerland as well. And very prominent, the war on pandemics. Also, perhaps somehow less, a little bit less um, um, intrusive than in other countries, but not really with difference. So this war on pandemic, I think that that, that was a, a very crucial thing now in, the, this, in this history. I, I'll come to that um, right afterwards. And so it goes on, you know, all these uh, fashionable wars. Um, this is, and, and beside that, the ongoing centralization of power. The cantons lose power and the, the center attracts power. That's, that's a, a natural law, so to speak. So this is the, what, what we um, celebrate. It's, it's, uh, it's not to celebrate, it's to deplore, I think, or it's to, to complain about, but that, that's what they celebrate about. It seems that this is a, a pattern. Of course, this is not only in, in Switzerland. Of course not. In other countries, to compare it with a very prominent country, we have approximately the same picture. I, I cannot say much about that. that. That's not the point now. Today, and a lot of you know much more about uh, many of you know much more about this, but in America, with a, with a sort of comparable constitution to the Swiss one, uh, we also have such things. Uh, by the way, there is an interesting difference. They had the constitution, if, if we take the constitution of 1787, that was adopted by all colonies. That's a, that's a crucial difference to Switzerland. So that was not a majority, but those 13 colonies they had to adopt in a certain process or over a certain uh, period of time, and then they get into, into force. That, that, was, that was a basis. But then the civil war <laughs> didn't come before, it came after. The civil war took place, of course, and, and that was quite comparable with the unionists that corresponds a little bit to these liberal cantons and the confederates that corresponds to the Sonderbund with a lot of differences, of course, but, but there is some interesting parallel between these. And then a lot of wars, which is typical for states um, and also the United States. I do not precisely know when they celebrate what. Uh, once they had this bicentennial, but that was not from this, this constitution, but that was from the Declaration of Independence. But however, maybe they also think one should celebrate something. Now, we have still more time, a quarter of an hour. I, is it still OK yeah. with uh, dropping in, maybe, or so? No? Now, now the future. I have to say something about the remaining, remaining about the next 25 years, you know? This is what I thought about, 175. What about the, the bicentennial, huh? the Swiss bicentennial, the centennial, what's about that? Now again, to keep that in mind, we have, uh, we come to 2023. We have this war on climate change, the war on pandemics, the war on binarity, the war on whatever. There are always reasons for the states to make war. And now I think maybe this is a consequence of this um, COVID nightmare that, that certain tendencies come up that did not, that were not act articulated in earlier times, but now because people realize the danger of such a structure, such a monopolized structure, they begin to think about it. And that's why some 
blue elements maybe are coming up more for more more um, strong than than in earlier times there are grassroots organizations i always now speak about switzerland maybe in other countries there are sim similar things and these are sometimes a little bit crazy organizations but but it's the sign that people think, well, what, what is this all about? We, we do not need the state, we can do it ourselves. And, and grassroots, they use this word, grassroots is quite good. It, it, you know, all these, these grass pieces and they belong together somewhere on the ground. And, uh, so, and these are interesting movements. And they are very critical um, against, uh, to, to the state or other new movements, maybe especially, again, that, that had resisted, that had organized, you know, demonstrations against this COVID um, hysteria. And, and, and they are still existing, these movements, and they participate in the election. Now there is an election term of, of the national level, and some of them do, do um, uh, candidate. Uh, do present candidates for this. Of course, they have the risk that once they are elected, they become part of the system. Uh, the, that's, that's often the case, but maybe some manage to, you know, uh, change things. Uh, but in any way, it's a sign that it's not that clear and accepted anymore that there is a state. Um, now it, it, it starts, you know, tipping over. Um, they discuss, I think among you also some, about alternatives to the fiat money. Or this is a, a sign perhaps that doubts about the faith in the states are coming up. And I think the faith in the state is probably the most important basis of this structure. I mean, it's, it's ultimately perhaps a very unstable structure, I can imagine, the state, because it's fully artificial. You have to have huge organizations and uh, re um, intruding um, um, procedures and surveillance and all these things um, just to maintain the system and maybe all this won't be sufficient unless the people believe in this structure. So the, the faith, I think, is a very important thing. And, and things like that, maybe these are not yet very important things, but they could be signs that this faith is, is fading, you know? With tax avoidance, I do not mean just tax tax evasion and tax fraud, that of course takes place um, uh, always more or less today, more or less than more. Um, but, but the attitude of people that say we, we, we behave in other ways, we go back more to, you know, um, exchange economy. We do not pay in the official money way, but in other ways among our group, things like that. And, and they, they sort of, of evade statist influence. There are tendencies in that direction. And now one, one can speculate when, in some years, 2030 perhaps or so, this goes on, this, this phase, maybe they say the state, what, is that just a firm? Is that a, a player, an actor? Today already there are some movements that that articulate that very much. The state is just a firm, that's just a player. Um, he, he also is filed in some um, business indexes as an actor. This means this is not the state anymore, things like that. Um, so all, all this and thinking about statelessness could, could come up. Maybe due or thanks to Corona. And once this is going on, let's say I thought, now I'm, now I'm starting to dream, you know, but um, why not? Um, 
I, I thought that, ca can you read it? Um, a, um, tax resistance, then exit declarations, that happens already today, that people say, I do not want to, to, to be a member of that club there, um, here is my declaration, I, I withdraw my membership without being forced to leave the country, of course. Of course, these letters will not be answered, but, but people think about things like that. Or then I thought, I dreamed that once these declarations are there, once a certain broader tax resistance that um, rating agencies think about the rates of this government bonds, are they really still triple A or are they already junk bonds, you know, why not? Uh, that some, some ratings have already, has alre have already been reduced and um, the more such discussions come up, the more uh, this could uh, take place even more um, uh, um, f uh, uh, with, with more um, weight. And then they start about thinking, why not winding up some parts, at least the most, the most um, negative parts, unnecessary part of a state. Why not liquidate this part? Why not privatize? Now this is really, this is within the stream, but uh, why not to think about that? Why not to see signs for a certain um, development that could go in such a direction? It's not more than a, than a dream, but nevertheless, it's that. Um, so that there is a general decline of this power, that it's not just continuing, that it goes even in a fall movement. And why not? On the 12th September of 2048, we get the final report about the Swiss Confederation being wound up, winded up. Um, all debts paid back, not all, of course. A small dividend, perhaps only, but the file is closed. That was what I dreamed recently. And in, in this case, one could say this balance there to celebrate the birthday this year can be, you know, flow away and we can, <laughs> instead of that, this happy ending. Now, just one more slide to broaden even more, or again to broad our view. To come back to this, we have now the whole statist context. We have these 200 years. I just presented what tiny Switzerland is concerned. We have this rising phenomenon from the blue to the red part that goes back again after 200 years. We have bigger players like the one I showed you before, for instance, the United States of America, where a similar phenomenon could take place, that lasts longer, of course. That's, that's um, a Thorsten uh, Polite. This is what we talked about, this accounting principle, you know, first, last in, first out. Um, so Switzerland, last in, first out. United States, earlier in, later out. And First in and last out will be the overall phenomenon of status structure. That will last even longer, of course, but uh, why not um, be within the same context, within the same tendency? Maybe that in tiny Switzerland, because of this bloody um, COVID issue, people uh, think about status um, um, structures, Switzerland states is liquidated, other states as well, and so on. And maybe, I'm still dreaming, of course, um, maybe on the global level we have the same tendency. And then one could say, 
um, we resume, so to speak, these decentralized anarchist structures that were interrupted somewhere by this statist time. And once this is made, then really we can say we have a happy ending. Well, thank you.